Um, next up is uh, Samir Saba, is Professor in Chief of Division of Cardiology and Co Director of the Heart and Vascular Institute. Uh, he will be enlightening us about <clears throat> what we have learned about left atrial appendage occlusion over the past decade. This will build nicely on the, on the live recorded case that Pemmel uh, demonstrated earlier today. Thanks, Samir. Thank you, Eves, and the organizers for the invitation. So, my task over the coming eight minutes is to talk about percutaneous uh, left atrial appendage occlusion. What have we learned? I'm going to jump uh, right into it because there is a lot uh, to cover. These are my disclosures. All right, I'm preaching to the choir here when I tell you that uh, atrial fibrillation is associated with, is a strong predictor of uh, the risk of stroke. About 15% of all strokes are attributable to atrial fibrillation whether the patient is known to have atrial fibrillation at the time of the stroke or not. In older patients, this is even worse. It's the number one predictor of stroke, and uh, obviously oral anticoagulation is the treatment. The problem is that 40 to 50% of patients who should be on oral anticoagulation do not take oral anticoagulation, either because of a prior, risk, uh, a prior history of bleeding or a perceived risk of bleeding, and that leaves a lot of strokes and a lot of costs uh, on Medicare and the healthcare system. Well, it's not that patients do not recognize that there is a risk of stroke. It's just that, <clears throat> excuse me, they feel stuck between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, the risks of stroke and the risk of, uh, uh, of bleeding go up hand in hand. So it's kind of almost like uh, choose your poison. You see the overlap between the has bled and the chas to vas score. It's a catch-22. Do you rather get a major bleed or a stroke? And that's the dilemma that we've been facing until we had the percutaneous left atrial appendage closure devices, as Jackie mentioned. Uh, when we move from open surgery to uh, oversew or excise the left atrial appendage, it's limited in terms of its applicability. Until we got the percutaneous option, it became much more of an option that you know, broke that vicious circle that we have. This has been present for the past uh, uh, 10 years in Europe first, as is often the case, and then the Watchman was the first device approved in the US in 2015, and it's a plug, <coughs> excuse me, me with a mesh on top of it that you deploy at the entrance at the ostium of the left atrial appendage. And then six years later came the amulet, which, as we heard earlier, is uh, built on the platform of a PFO closure device. It has a lobe that goes a little bit deeper in the ostium, and then the disc that uh, sits on the outside as a suction cup. So what have we learned over the past uh, 10 years? Uh, I uh, consolidated uh, the, the, the lessons into 10 lessons that I'm going to go over in rapid fire. All right, first of all, the procedure is uh, technically very successful. Whether we're talking about the ACP, the Amplatzer, which is the predecessor of the amulet, or whether we're talking about the, the Watchman, we have a success rate, a technical success rate of closing the appendage of in the mid 90%, 90% like 4 or 5% failure, and depending on the study, you have even smaller numbers. It's also a very safe procedure. As you see the curves, when you get to more recent, as, as we develop the, the skills, the, uh, uh, the, the procedure uh, major complications, including embolization of the device or uh, stroke or death or tamponade have become around 1%. So that's important. Lesson number two is that these devices really help, and over the long term, they do protect against uh, uh, stroke or thromboembolic events. These data are from the PREVAIL and PROTECT AF trials, which are the watchmen. Those are the two trials that form the basis of the approval uh, uh, by the FDA. And when you look at the five-year outcome between Coumadin and the uh, uh, left atrial appendage closure, you, you see that there is no, it's non-inferior. It's equivalent in terms of the protection. Needless to say, the patient that had the device had less bleeding, uh, uh, hemorrhagic stroke and what have you, which accounts for a lower uh, all-cause mortality, at least in this analysis. Third, uh, the, the two devices that, have, that we have available are the amulet as well as the uh, watchman. There was one randomized trial, 18 plus 100 uh, patients, randomizing those patients to the amulet and the watchman, and there is non-inferiority, meaning that uh, uh, in terms of the bleeding risk or cardiovascular death, from a safety perspective, they're equivalent, as well as at 18 months from the protection against stroke and thromboembolic events, they're also equivalent. A caveat uh, here, this was uh, funded by Abbott, so this is the amulet study that showed the non-inferiority, and this was compared to the uh, Watchman 2.5, so this is not what we implant today with the Watchman Flex that we have. Not that the, the, the results would have been different, but just putting it out there, we don't have data on this comparison. 
Lesson number four, <clears throat> the things that are complicated have fallen as they should by the wayside. What, is, what does that mean? The lariat, you may, some of you may remember. It's a complicated procedure where we would go transeptal into the left atrial appendage, and then we connect through the subxiphoid, through the pericardium, and the two wires are magnetic. We connect them together, and then we, we advance a uh, stitch to the ostium, and we cinch it down, not only closing the uh, left atrial appendage, but also killing the muscle. And, uh, you know, most of the places that have done a lot of these procedures have had close encounters with complications, and uh, most importantly, we have better options that are much, much simpler. The last attempt at reviving this, uh, uh, this technology was the AMAZE trial, which said, well, by killing the muscle, you reduce the likelihood of recurrence of atrial fibrillation. So the AMAZE trial basically uh, randomized patients to AFib ablation alone or AFib ablation with the lariat device and did not show any difference in the recurrence of atrial fibrillation. So that was the last nail in the coffin of this technology. Okay, lesson uh, number five, anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. The left atrial appendage varies in size and morphology. We used to use a lot of those uh, uh, food uh, analogies, the chicken wing and the broccoli and the uh, what have you. Needless to say, the, the devices have to adapt to the varying ana uh, anatomies. And the two devices that we have today in the US are the Watchman Flex and the Amulet. But there are other devices elsewhere in the world, in Asia, the Lambre, et cetera, uh, that uh, so far they're not available to us. And on the anatomy, and of things. Uh, we guide ourselves with uh, mainly TEEs and fluoroscopy and sometimes CT scans ahead of time to, to plan the procedure and sometimes you have a very wide ostium and very uh, shallow. Uh, the second, this, the small ostium, this was a case that I uh, aborted earlier this week because the, uh, the ostium was four millimeters. There is no device that closes a four millimeter uh, uh, ostium and uh, you see here the five sizes of the Watchman Flex going from 20 uh, millimeters up and then and from for the, uh, the eight sizes for the amulet going from 16 millimeters up. And uh, the, for, the, for the amulet, by the way, it's the size of the uh, lobe, not the size of the disc that we're talking about. Lesson number six, imaging is very important. Uh, number one, we need to rule clots, correct? You know, if you have a clot in the left atrial appendage, we're not gonna be doing anything for it. This image on the left is the biggest clot that I've seen in the left atrial appendage sent to me by Madur Singh from our group in, uh, in Hammett. But it's not only the clot that prevents the procedure from happening, it's also this whole DRT, device-related thrombosis that sometimes happens in our experience at about 4%, meaning a clot forms on the outside surface of the device, and that's a problem, especially if you're implanting the, the device in someone who has a very high risk of bleeding. Uh, that patient has to be committed to anticoagulation, otherwise the risk of stroke is, is, is very high. You know, managing the procedure itself, where do you cross uh, the septum? Yesterday, literally yesterday, I crossed, uh, I did a patient who had a uh, mitral clip, and I learned yesterday that we cross high in the septum with a mitral clip, I didn't know that. So I took the short, uh, the, the short course and uh, crossed, and I couldn't align the, the watchman with the, with the appendage. So I had to go back on heparin, low, and recross. So that is one thing. So guiding where we cross, guiding where we size, for the amulet we size, one, 1 1.2 centimeters inside the ostium for the watchman on the outside, and then also looking at the stability of the device. Lesson number eight, number eight is the whole leak thing, correct? The, uh, you know, uh, as, as the FDA approved the watchman, industry pushed this whole concept that leaks below five millimeters do not matter, and it never made too much sense. A clot of three millimeters or four millimeters can still lead to a big, uh, to a big stroke. And now we pay much more attention because we have data that shows that, yes, if you take all comers, uh, you know, the anticoagulation is equivalent to closing with less than five millimeter leak, but if you separate those that have zero millimeter leaks versus less than five millimeters, there is a twofold, at least twofold difference in the risk of stroke, and that is important, so that's what we should be shooting for. Left atrial appendage happening at the same time as an AFib ablation. This is mainly for the electrophysiologist. We face this question frequently. It is doable. As you see from these registries, it, re it decreases appropriately the risk of stroke and the uh, bleeding, equivalent to what you would get if you were to use uh, anticoagulation. From a DRG perspective and reimbursement perspective, it's a problem because you don't get reimbursed for 
both the RGs. You get reimbursed at this point for one of them. But most importantly, the option trial, which we were part of, uh, uh, randomizing uh, 1,600 patients uh, worldwide to AFib ablation with oral anticoagulation versus with left atrial appendage closure. Uh, it's finished enrolling, and you, uh, it's looking for non-inferiority for, uh, the, for the protection, for the efficacy, and superiority for the non uh, procedure related bleeding, so we'll look forward for these results. Lesson number 10, you know, we can bo use both the Watchman today as well as the amulet with dual antiplatelets. It used to be that the Watchman, you had to use it with at least 45 days of anticoagulation. The reality is that we had a lot of patients bleeding a lot in the first 45 days, so that is a good thing. Not that they don't bleed on Plavix and aspirin, but that's, that's an important, uh, uh, you know, contribution. Um, so I'm gonna close with this study. Future directions, this could be a talk in of itself, but I'm gonna be brief. We need, we have a lot of variability in the anatomy. There are always new devices from newer companies or even from the same companies. I stumbled on this design from, uh, uh, from uh, um, Boston Scientific that makes the Watchman looking at, uh, this is uh, from, from a, uh, an IP, from a uh, patent application that looks like they're doing also a lobe and a disc. So will we see this device uh, coming down the pike? Who knows, but, uh, but at least there are those, uh, uh, those uh, plans. Uh, as you know, the uh, Watchman Pinnacle is about to come, which is uh, the next generation uh, for the Watchman. Uh, physicians and uh, patients and referring physicians primarily are voting with their feet they, to get the option of giving the left atrial appendage device as opposed to oral anticoagulation. This will likely open up if the results of Champion AF and Catalyst, those are two studies we were part of. Champion has, uh, it was with the Watchman, it finished enrollment. Catalyst is still enrolling with the, uh, with the amulet and those um, Two studies are taking patients uh, that are indicated for anticoagulation and randomizing them without any history of bleeding or risk of bleeding to left atrial appendage closure versus, uh, versus DOAX. Uh, single, uh, you know, uh, antiplatelet agent as opposed to dual antiplatelet agent may be coming down the pike. Still patients, as I said, bleed on Plavix and aspirin. At least some registry data from Europe seems to indicate that you don't do too bad with single antiplatelet uh, agents. And as was alluded to uh, before, uh, we, uh, uh, we impose a lot on our ECHO folks uh, to be with us uh, the whole day doing uh, uh, left atrial appendage closures and uh, they, they only have a couple of RVUs to show for it at the end of the day, so maybe phased array is gonna be the next thing. With this, I'll stop. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much.